Good morning, everybody. Um, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, um, you can go ahead and tell us where you're calling in from as well as what organization you're from. Good morning, everybody. As we wait for everyone to join us, you can go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Um, go ahead and tell us where you are um, calling in from, as well as what organization you're from. And we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you can go ahead and start introducing yourself in the chat um, while we wait just one or two more minutes um, for everyone to join us, um, go ahead and say your organization name as well as um, what country you're calling in from. All right, we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this morning or evening for um, some of you. Um, today, this webinar um, will be on your role in identifying and reporting instances of fraud in the ASAP2 activity. Um, and we have some excellent presenters with us today. Just a brief introduction on um, as we get started. Welcome to everybody. Thank you for letting us know where you're from in the chat. Um, go ahead and continue to do that if you haven't already. If you have any questions throughout the course of the webinar, um, please feel free to ask those questions in the Q&A box. Um, throughout the webinar, you're free to make comments or answer any of the presenter's questions in the chat box. We'll be monitoring the Q&A box for any um, questions that you might want the presenters to answer. So feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box. The presentation for today's webinar, um, as well as recording, can be available will be available at the ASAP Resources website, um, and I will send that link in the chat in a few minutes. Um, there you'll have the recording available as well as the presentation slides um, in the coming days. A brief introduction on the ASAP project. ASAP is advanced support to advanced local partners, accelerating sports advanced local partners. Um, and then we are currently in the second stage of the project. The first stage of the project began in 2019, um, and the second stage of the project um, began a couple of years ago in 2022. The purpose of the project is to rapidly prepare local partners to have the capabilities and resources to serve as prime partners for USAID and PEPFAR programming in compliance with USAID and PEPFAR procedures for PEPFAR program implementation. We have two strategic objectives. The first is to strengthen local partners as they transition to receive PEPFAR funding um, as a USAID prime partner to comply with regulations. And then the second is to prepare local partners to directly manage, implement, and monitor PEPFAR programs. Here's a list of our current ASAP2 supported countries. And I see some of you um, are from some of these countries. Um, we've supported 18 countries in total, um, and you can see a list of additional ASAP-1 supported countries. Some key results from ASAP-1 and ASAP-2. ASAP has, a, has supported 126 local organizations in 18 different countries, 113 local partner um, organizations, um, as well as 13 local government partners have participated in our programming. 
USAID and ASAP have broadcasted 93 webinars for more than 21,000 attendees in 76 different countries. So thank you for being among those participants. Many of those 93 webinars can be found at our ASAP resources page for you to utilize as a resource um, and recordings as well as presentation slides um, are available for you to view at any time. Many of our webinars are available in three different languages, French, Portuguese, and English, um, and you can filter your search um, by any of those languages as well as any relevant topics. And again, these resources are available to you um, whenever you need them. We have three upcoming webinars on August 17th. Um, Doug Frankie will be presenting on procurement and property management compliance issues. On August 31st, we'll do a webinar on USAID financial policies, internal controls, and compliance. Um, and later in the year in September, uh, we will do, be doing a webinar on USG rules and regulations for cost principles. In addition to the webinars, another resource available to you is the communities of practice. We have six active communities of practice, um, all listed here on the slide. Um, and a couple of upcoming meetings are listed here, um, as well as a link to register. If you're interested in joining communities of practice, um, feel free to register at the link that I'll share in the chat shortly. We are excited today to have three um, presenters with us. Um, Antonio Crombie, Jessica Guzman, and Karen Warfield. Um, we are excited to have them present today. Um, as well as facilitate and answering questions. So I will pass it over to Antonio um, as we begin this webinar. Antonio, over to you. Thank you, Melissa, and greetings, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ASAP2 webinar on your role in identifying and reporting instances of fraud. Uh, as Melissa mentioned, my name is Antonio Crombie, and I'm a senior manager at Deloitte, where I focus on transparency and accountability in, the inter in uh, international development. I'm a risk management leader, and as part of my responsibilities, I am currently helping to implement USAID projects in Ukraine and Serbia, focused on reducing fraud and corruption. Uh, I'll be one of your facilitators today, and joining me is Jess Guzman, a Deloitte senior consultant and fraud specialist who is collaborating with me in Ukraine, as well as Karen Warfield, uh, Deloitte senior manager who helps organizations uh, enhance their risk management and compliance capabilities. Uh, we're very excited to be here today because all three of us are very passionate about this sub about this subject. Can we advance to the next slide, please? So during this webinar, you can expect to learn different approaches to identifying, combating, and reporting on uh, fraud and corruption, as well as understand the consequences of committing fraud. So during today, uh, we will be defining fraud and why it's important. And then we'll be talking about what is your role in combating fraud and corruption? And specifically, we're going to provide you with um, information that you can use uh, in your everyday role to identify fraud and corruption, to combat on how to combat fraud and corruption. And more importantly, when you see fraud uh, and corruption, how do you report it? Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when fraud uh, and corruption is detected and reported, uh, and specifically the role of your the partner organization you work with, as well as IntraHealth, and more and uh, even more importantly, the role of um, the USAID Inspector General. And then finally, we'll provide a link, well, links to additional resources where you can learn more about this very important topic. Um, throughout today's sessions, we'll have five knowledge checks that you'll be able to use uh, the uh, Zoom to answer them. And additionally, we want you to ask questions by using the Q&A feature in Zoom. As we go through the presentation, we will do our best to answer your questions. However, if we're not able to answer your questions, we will provide follow-up answers uh, following this training. Can we flip to the next, next slide, please? So um, in, the, in this first section, we'll define what fraud is. But before we go into that, I just want to share a very brief story um, about a potential fraud instance. Uh, I was recently traveling uh, in Eastern Europe on vacation. And on my second full day, I experienced a, a major medical incident. Um, 
And when I woke up the next morning, I could tell that it was very, very serious and that I needed to seek immediate medical treatment. Um, I was at, I asked around, uh, I, was, I was very unfamiliar with the country. Uh, I asked around uh, and was told by people that who I didn't know, but who were kind enough to share um, their opinions on where I should go to get treated, to visit this one particular medical facility all the way on the other side of town. Now, I, I've traveled to more than 30 countries, but I have never, um, you know, in my travels ever had to seek medical treatment until this point. So I had really no idea what I was walking, you know, what I was going to get into. Uh, so I went to the facility and the doctor saw me and told me that I had broken and dislocated my fifth metatarsal, which is a bone in your foot that's, that's apparently very important. Uh, and they advised me that I needed to have surgery right away in order to repair the injury uh, and that it could do it in two days. Um, because I was traveling and I didn't uh, really want to recover uh, overseas, um, I politely declined and said that I would just rather go home uh, and consult with my own doctor first. And I asked him what were my options at that point. Um, so he basically told me that he would prescribe me some pain medication, pain medications, uh, but that he would have to refer me to another place for further treatment um, so that I could actually get home. And it was at this point that alarm bells started going off in my head because through some of the anti-corruption work that I've performed, I've heard stories where patients had to make some type of a payment uh, in order to actually get the referral for medical, for additional medical treatment um, uh, that are not available at that facility. Luckily for me, the doctor made the referral without asking for any additional payment. Um, and so while I was personally relieved, I do know that um, many people in other countries aren't so lucky. Uh, and so that while, while that may have been one potential instance of fraud and corruption, let's, more, let's dive into it a little bit. Let's um, fully explore what fraud is and why it's important. Can we go to the next slide, please? So Alan Greenspan was the chairman of the US Federal Reserve for <clears throat> excuse me, nearly two decades. He's a very highly respected figure in the international community. And he had this to say about fraud and corruption. <clears throat> corruption, embezzlement, and fraud, these are all characteristics which exist everywhere. And it is regrettably the way that human nature functions, whether we like it or not. <clears throat> However, what successful economies do is keep it to a minimum. And what Chairman Greenspan is reminding us of are really two things. First, fraud and corruption have existed since practically the dawn of humankind. And as a result, it's been a central part of our human experience. Second, because it's human nature, it's virtually impossible to eliminate it. But that doesn't mean that we can't take steps to minimize it. And that's really why we're here today. We're gonna to learn some things uh, that are important that we can all do to minimize the impact of fraud and corruption uh, on the communities and the organizations that we live and serve. Next slide, please. So when we think about fraud, uh, fraud is generally defined as the intentional or deliberate deception or misrepresentation for financial or personal gain. Uh, and there are three types of fraud, uh, misrepresentation, falsification, and concealment. Misrepresentation refers to providing false or misleading information with the intention to deceive or mislead others. Uh, this can involve providing inaccurate details about the quality, the quantity, or the, the origin, or even the safety of health commodities and products. This can lead to substandard products uh, being used that jeopardize patient safety and compromise the effectiveness of healthcare interventions. Falsification involves the deliberate alteration or fabrication of documents, records, or data in order to misrepresent the truth. So this can include things, for example, like forging or tampering with documentation related to product quality, the expiration dates, batch numbers, manufacturing origins uh, in order to you know, bypass quality control measures or manipulate inventory levels or even deceive authorities regarding the legitimacy or authenticity of healthcare products and commodities. 
Finally, uh, there is concealment, uh, which refers to intentionally hiding information that should be disclosed in the public health supply chain. Now, this can involve withholding vital details about the condition of healthcare products and commodities, or even the failure to report adverse events such as product defects or safety concerns. These three types of fraud can undermine the integrity of the public health supply chain. Um, fraud can compromise patient safety, uh, and it can also result in financial losses. As we'll learn later, it's, it'll be critical to really establish robust systems for transparency, uh, for accountability, along with stringent monitoring and enforcement mechanisms in order to combat fraud and safeguard healthcare delivery. Next slide, please. So when uh, identifying fraud and corruption can be a very complex task and understanding if fraud has occurred is really based on a unique set of facts and circumstances related to that particular incident. But generally, there are three key elements that often come together uh, to facilitate fraudulent activity, uh, opportunity, rationalization, and pressure. This is often referred to as the fraud triangle. Um, let me talk about opportunity. Opportunity refers to situations where individuals have uh, might have access to resources or information, or they occupy a position of power that enables them to carry out fraudulent acts without being detected. Uh, these opportunities can arise because there might be um, a weak system of internal controls, there may, there may be inadequate oversight, or there may be gaps or holes in the system that allow for people to manipulate or exploit um, you know, information resources or their position of power. The second element refers to someone's ability to rationalize or justify their decision. Um, individuals who engage in fraud often convince themselves that their actions are necessary um, or acceptable or even warranted under the circumstances. They may convince themselves that they deserve the illicit gains uh, or that they are simply rectifying a particular injustice um, or they just need to satisfy or they just need to take whatever action is necessary in order to satisfy some financial need. Rationalizations can be driven by personal circumstances. Uh, it can be driven by financial pressures such as being you know someone being highly in debt um, or, it can be um, driven by a perceived lack of available alternatives that if they, you know, there's no other option for them. <clears throat> the third element pressure refers to the incentives or motivations to commit fraud. Uh, pressure can manifest itself in various forms such as financial difficulties, mounting debts, um, have, you know, ha having uh, an addiction um, or just personal ambitions. Uh, individual, individuals facing significant pressures uh, may just feel compelled to engage in fraudulent activities as a means to alleviate their current circumstances uh, or just to achieve a personal gain. To identify fraud <clears throat> and corruption using the, the fraud triangle, um, what investigators do is that they evaluate the existence of any opportunities that uh, for fraud um, and assess whether rationalizations may be present or rec you know and recognize any external or internal pressures that could drive the individuals towards committing fraud uh, fraudulent acts. Um, by understanding and addressing these three components, you can implement preventative measures to enhance your internal controls to develop effective fraud detection strategies uh, in order to minimize the risk of fraud and corruption. Next slide, please. So 
Fraud can have a devastating impact on victims, including taking away from your capacity to provide adequate healthcare treatment to patients or to comply with USAID grant requirements. Um, a lot of these um, implications are self-evident, such as financial and legal ramifications, but let me highlight three implications in particular. Um, first, fraud can have Dam, um, can result in damaged excuse me, damaged reputations, uh, not only to the perpetrators of the fraud, but also for the victims of fraud. When fraud occurs, it's often considered a newsworthy topic because of who may be involved or the legal issues it entails. Uh, but organizations that are the victims of fraud can also suffer reputational damage because it can be inferred that they may have had that they may have had a a weak internal control environment that allowed the fraud to occur in the first place. Second, <clears throat> employee morale and ultimately their producti their productivity uh, can also be damaged by instances of fraud. Uh, when fraud occurs, it can result in a persistent negative attitude towards the organization particularly if it goes unrecognized or unsolved, uh, or I'm sorry, unresolved. When fraud occurs, it just, you know, has a downward impact or a negative impact on, an, on employee performance and can it affect the quality of people's work. Uh, and finally, fraud can result in loss of trust, not only by the communities that we live and operate in, uh, but more importantly, it can result in loss of trust by USAID which can have negative consequences such as, um, you know, ending the activity or not, or, you know, not providing additional funds to carry out the activity. Next slide, please. Thank you. Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna now let's check one. Um, what are some implications of fraud and a, the program has fewer funds and resources to provide essential services. Stakeholders will lose trust. Employee morale may suffer. There may be legal ramifications, including criminal and civil penalties. So please do check the right answer. And um, also, if you do have any questions, you can definitely put them in our um, question and answer session. Um, so we can try and answer some of those questions. Um, Antonio, uh, you mentioned a few moments ago that understanding whether fraud has occurred or not is based on facts and circumstances. Can you explain what that means? Sure, Karen. <clears throat> Um, if you recall in the definition we discussed earlier, fraud has to be intentional or deliberate. Uh, in many jurisdictions around the world, when law enforcement uh, and the judiciary are trying to determine whether fraud was committed, what they're really looking for is intent. That is, did the person knowingly provide misinformation or falsify records or intentionally conceal uh, their actions? Uh, we may make we make mistakes uh, all of the time, but that really doesn't mean that our mistake rises to the level of fraud. Let's look at something as simple as issuing a payment to someone. Uh, and let's say that a payment to a supplier was supposed to be issued for $100, uh, but instead it was issued for $1,000. Now, if the person that issued the check just fat fingered a key and misplaced the decimal point, it's probably not a fraud. It's just simple negligence. Uh, however, if that same person knowingly issued a check for 10 times what was supposed to be issued because they have a kickback arrangement or some other type of scheme with the payee, then it might rise to the level of fraud. Thank you, Antonio. That was helpful. Um, so the answer is really all of the above. Um, Melissa, you can move over to the next slide. Thank you. And you can see most of them got it right with 90%. If you got it right, 
Okay, thank you so much, Karen and Antonio. Now that we have a better understanding of what fraud is and why it occurs, in this, the following sections, we'll get into identifying fraud, how do you combat fraud, and how do you report fraud and corruption. Melissa, you can flip to the next slide, please. Okay, so in part one, we're gonna talk through how do we identify fraud and corruption? What are some of the sources of fraud? What are some of the main types of fraud to look out for and what do they mean? What are some examples of the effects that fraud can have and some of the indicators of fraud that you can look out for to catch some of those instances? We can also look at some example fraud scenarios that could occur and some of the preventive steps that can, could have been taken to prevent those scenarios, okay? So now we'll get into what are the sources of fraud in the next slide. Okay, so what are the sources of fraud and who commits fraud? So this figure provides a graphical representation of some major sources of corruption that span from the central office and regulatory bodies to administrative functions such as procurement and extending all the way down to the service delivery level in the relationships between patients and providers, for example. With national governments, for example, regulatory bodies may be subject to fraud and corruption in the development and application of pharmaceutical registration, policies and procedures, health equipment standards, and quality control and inspections. Moving down with national, with subnational governments, and at the service delivery level, patients can experience numerous forms of fraud and corruption, including informal payments, bribes, or even sexual favors to receive treatment. Moving even further down, service delivery is also undermined by medical personnel absenteeism, ghost workers, dual practice, and referrals for personal profit. Now that we understand some of the sources of fraud and understand that fraud can come from anywhere, right? It can come from the top, it can come from those performing day-to-day -day functions. Now let's look at what some of the main types of fraud are that you can look out for on the next slide. Thank you. So let's walk through some of the main types of fraud that you can be on the lookout for, right? So the first one would be informal payments. Informal payments is the demanding or accepting of payments outside of official channels in exchange for goods and services. For example, a project contractor can re request additional payments from vendors or suppliers in exchange for awarding them contracts. Another example is theft. Theft is considered stealing stored items or inventory items for personal use or for resale. A good example of this would be if an employee is responsible for project inventory, such as medical supplies or construction materials, they steal these items for personal use and sell them or sell them to the black market. Further, we have data manipulation. This would be the falsification of records reports or documentation. One good example of this would be that data is manipulated to inflate project achievements and outcomes presenting false information to USAID for reporting purposes. Then there's also absenteeism and ghost workers. Absenteeism is the unexplained or unexcused absence of personnel and ghost workers is the fictitious individuals included in payroll or personnel records um, for you know, personal use of those that payroll. A good example of ghost workers, how fraud can be, how fraud can occur is where a project contractor creates fictitious individuals on the payroll who do not actually work at the project. And then they therefore divert those payroll funds to themselves. Then we move on to conflict of interest. 
For conflict of interest, this is when you're engaging in activities that compete with official duties, including accepting gifts from suppliers. For example, a project team member can award a contract to a company owned by a close relative, which undermines then the fairness of the competition of the procurement process. Then we finally have kickbacks. Kickbacks is the misappropriation of funds that enriches a person of power or influence who uses the power or influence to make a different individual richer. For example, a supplier or contractor can provide bribes to a purchaser or decision maker in exchange for gaining an unfair advantage in securing a, con a contract. So these are some examples of some common types of fraud to look out for um, as it relates to the ASAP2 activity. So let's explore some of the effects and indicators that we can expect to look for as it relates to these type of fraud. We can flip to the next slide. Okay. So the first step in understanding whether and how to handle fraud and corruption challenges is to identify what are the effects and what are the indicators, right? Fraud indicators can vary depending on specific circumstances. So let's go through some of these examples. So one of the examples of a fraud indicator would be patients are reporting being asked to pay informal fees. This indicator can tell us that this will lead to informal payments restricting access to the poor. Another example of an indicator would be overpriced commodities. Overpriced commodities can be an indicator of the, an effect that would lead to low efficiency due to fraud in procurement, right? This would be low efficiency in projects. Um, in addition, there's also the effect of diminished impact of initiatives, which the indicator for an instance like this would be an unnecessary middleman or a broker involved in contracts or purchases. In addition to the examples shown on the screen, some additional fraud indicators to watch out for are unexplained expenditures, fictitious invoices, um, unusual patterns of processes or financial transactions, lack of segregation of duties or limited checks and balances. It's important to note that these indicators serve as red flags that require further investigation and verification, which we will learn about in later sections. Okay, we can flip to the next slide. Okay, so now we'll get into a couple of high level examples of some fraud scenarios and we'll understand what could have been done to prevent this fraud from occurring. So in this first scenario that we have, a significant challenge arose. The issue of drug theft while moving large volumes of medication Due to cultural factor, factors, it was easy for individuals to intimidate others into silence. As a result, workers became aware of trucks carrying drugs and would inquire about missing items, creating suspicion of theft. Through queries, they identified that records were modified to show that drugs actually had arrived when they did not. One of the root causes of this problem was the lack of education regarding the true consequences of fraud, and in this case, theft. Communication on this matter was limited, which perpetuated the issue. In order to mitigate this problem, they implemented policy changes in procurement and contractor requirements aimed to address the loopholes that allowed for these diversions. This situation highlights the importance of addressing cultural aspects and ensuring proper education and communication within projects. By taking preventative measures like strengthening governance and oversight, implementing enhanced policies and procedures, protecting and encouraging whistleblowing, and enforcing consequences and sanctions, we can work towards a more secure and successful project implementation in the future and also work to avoid these type of fraud scenarios. Let's flip to the next slide to talk to another scenario. Okay. 
So another scenario is that there was a study done in 2018 and 2021 to understand the extent of corruption due to informal payments. The findings were troubling, revealing that low salaries for healthcare staff led to patients to feel compelled to pay extra for services. Additionally, the staff, the staff faced an increased workload, providing care even during off hours. Shockingly, many respondents believe that this practice was just a part of the culture. In order to tackle this issue, reforms were initiated to address the root causes. The focus was on increasing healthcare worker salaries and effectively communicating to patients about the government covered services. Although informal payments have decreased based on this study, it remains a cultural challenge. So let's talk through some of the preventative measures that could have been taken here. So similar to uh, the previous scenario, right? we wanna strengthen oversight. We wanna strengthen our policies. In addition, we want to strengthen that communication and education, strengthen anti-corruption measures, and especially foster a culture of transparency and accountability. Okay. So I think now we are at our knowledge check number two. So I will pass it over to Karen for our next knowledge check. Thank you, Jessica. Um, knowledge check number two. What are some common types of fraud to look for? Um, informal payments and kickbacks, theft, data manipulation, absenteeism and ghost workers, or all of the above? So Antonio, uh, I guess so you said, um, how can you, how can we effectively um, identify potential fraud and corruption in our projects? What do you think um, um, could be some of them? Yep, Karen. So you, you, you mentioned how can we effectively identify uh, potential fraud and corruption in our projects, right? So identifying fraud and yes. corruption requires vigilance and awareness, right? You can actively look for discrepancies in financial records, suspicious transactions, unexplained expenses, or any unusual patterns of behavior amongst project stakeholders. Additionally, fostering a culture of integrity and open communication within the organizations and project teams can encourage whistleblowing and early detection of fraud. And these are some concepts that we'll get into later on in the slides as well. Um, and we do have one more question in the chat as you still uh, put your answers in for the knowledge check. Um, right, the poll ended. Um, I'll read off the answers and then we can go back to answering the question, Jess. Um, so essentially the answer really is all of the above and about 94% if you got it right. So thank you very much for that. Um, just as a question in the chat, um, is there a mechanism we can use to prevent corruption? Yeah, yeah. And we will, uh, this is actually the next section that we will get into, but um, at a high level, you know, corruption can be prevented by taking steps to understand, you know, what type of fraud the organization may face based on its activities. This is a key aspect of combating just that understanding piece. Um, you can also institute or enhance policies and procedures to help prevent um, and detect fraud and corruption and continuously educate employees and vendors about their responsibilities as it relates to preventing fraud. I think it also might be good to know if you can provide some examples of common fraud scenarios that may occur um, on, on the project as well. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So some common fraud scenarios that can, that can occur include, you know, fictitious vendors, um, contractors, inflating project expenses, collusion between employees and suppliers to manipulate the procurement processes, you know, diversion of project funds for personal gain, uh, misrepresentation of project outcomes to donors, 
Um, and additionally, another example would be ghost beneficiaries, which we briefly touched on ghost workers uh, receiving duplicate, duplicate aid or also common fraud scenarios to look out for. Over back to you, Jess. Okay. So next slide. Okay. So now we've gone into part two of section two. So your role in combating fraud and corruption. How do we combat fraud and corruption? So I don't, so in this section, we're gonna get into how do you combat fraud? What are the some approaches to identifying and combating, which we briefly touched on? And what is your role in identifying and combating corruption? So first, how do we combat corruption? Fraud and corruption can be combated through three approaches, prevention, detection, and response. In preventing fraud and corruption, our key focus is on building a robust infrastructure. This means establishing strong governance frameworks, implementing effective policies, and utilizing preventative and detective controls. We also prioritize training and communication programs to promote the integrity-driven culture throughout the organization. For detection, we examine factors influencing corruption and fraud, conducting risk assessments, and implementing detective processes using technology and data and analysis, like spot checks and fund flow mapping. Finally, to strengthen our response, we design investigative approaches, undertake thorough discovery, and conduct qualitative evaluation and analysis. Transparency and efficiency in reporting processes enable swift action when necessary. Now let's talk about what are some of the approaches we can take to identify and combat fraud. Let's to the next slide. Okay, great. So let's talk through some of these approaches. We have two different sets of approaches here. The first set of approaches are high level approaches that every organization and individual should keep in mind when combating and identifying fraud. So the first one is establishing robust policies and procedures to set ethical guidelines and expectations as we've already discussed briefly, implementing well-defined procedures and controls for transparency and accountability, including segregation of duties to minim minimize risks, monitoring for red flags to detect potential fraudulent activities, for encouraging whistleblowing and early detection through effective reporting mechanisms, and five, validating the effectiveness of anti-fraud measures through audits and assurance. At the program level, you have five different approaches. First, identifying actors and stakeholders within the ASAP2 activity to understand their roles. Analyze potential fraud and corruption risks based on motivations. And you can refer back to what we've learned on the, tri on the fraud triangle. Ensure compliance with policies and procedures to prevent and detect fraud and ensure that those policies and procedures are adequate. Conduct risk-based testing of policies and controls for efficiency, as well as complying with code of ethics and complying with those policies. And identify specific fraud risk and categories related to ASAP to activity for mitigation and awareness. By integrating these approaches, you can build a shield ensuring a culture of integrity, accountability, and transparency, and helping to identifying and combating fraud on the forefront. Okay, now let's get a little bit more into the approach of policies and procedures on the next slide. Thank you. Okay. With the foundation of strong policies and procedures like we just discussed, we can strengthen this approach through use of a code of ethics and a fraud policy. A code of ethics first, for, further strengthens 
this approach by defining core values of the organization, individual responsibilities, defining potential sanctions for violating what are those consequences, um, identifying what reporting method mechanisms for unethical conduct, and it ensures transparency and accountability while also protecting whistleblowers. Further, the fraud policy also reinforces the organization's stance on against corruption. It helps to outline risk appetite and ethical standards regarding fraud and corruption. It establishes the roles, procedures, and controls to identify, prevent, detect, and respond to fraud activities. This policy also lays out investigative procedures, potential consequences to disciplinary measures. So now you must be wondering, okay, so what's my role in preventing and identifying fraud and corruption? Let's get into that a little bit on the next slide. Okay, we can flip. Thank you. Okay, so your role in combating fraud plays a crucial part in upholding ethical standards and preventing fraud. First and foremost, you must adhere to and promote the highest standards of ethical conduct. Actions set the tone for the entire organization. It's essential to know and understand the policies we need to follow. These policies provide a clear roadmap for ethical behavior and compliance with regulations. You should understand and implement fraud and corruption prevention approaches similar to those that we just learned in the previous sections, equipping you with tools to identify and prevent fraud activities. If you come across any concerns or suspicious activities, it's absolutely vital to report them promptly. Your vigilance is a powerful weapon in the fight against fraud. Additionally, we'll share valuable information later on on how to report fraud to the Office of the Inspector General. Your cooperation is instrumental in maintaining integrity within your organization. Now I will hand it back over to Karen for Knowledge Check Brief. Knowledge Check number three. Which of the following are not ways of identifying and preventing fraud and corruption? A, adjourn to the code of ethics. B, segregation of duties and responsibilities. C, ignore the fraud policy. D, report concerns properly. And E, prompt information on how to report to the OIG. Um, so there's no other questions in the chat. Let me see. Um, yeah, this. So um, just what specific actions can I take to com combat fraud or corruption? Um, on our projects. For Karen, so there are several actions you can take to combat fraud and corruption in your projects, right? You can start by actively adhering to policies and procedures. You know, we've mentioned the importance of the policies and procedures in combating fraud. You can ensure transparency and accountability in all project activities. Additionally, promoting segregation of duties and clearly defining roles and responsibilities in projects can help minimize the risk of fraud. And by implementing monitoring mechanisms and in encouraging reporting and promoting how to report um, can also promptly be effective ways to combat fraud. Okay. And the, um, you can go ahead and close the poll, I guess, Melissa. The answer is really C, ignoring the fraud, fraud policy and about 89% of you got that right. So good job. Um, Jess, can you elaborate on some um, practical approaches to identify and combat fraud effectively? Sure. So some of the things that you can do are adopt risk-based approaches to by conducting regular risk assessments, to identify what are those vulnerabilities in projects, right? You can implement internal controls and regular audits to help early detection and prevention of fraud. You can leverage activities to perform data, data analytics, which can aid in monitoring transactions as well as identifying anomalies. 
in any given circumstance. Training and awareness programs are also really important for employees and stakeholders to empower them to recognize and report fraud. And lastly, of course, collaborating with authorities and, and, and agencies to investigate and prosecute fraud and corruption can be a crucial part of an effective anti-fraud strategy as well. So Jess, you can continue with the next session, uh, section. I guess there's no other questions in the chat. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So now we get into the last uh, part of section two, your role in combating fraud, reporting fraud and corruption. So in this section, we'll go in this part, we'll actually we'll go ahead and learn where should you report fraud? What are some critical matters that you should keep in mind to report? What should you report when you decide to report um, an instance of fraud? And what protections exist when something is reported? Okay, we can flip to the next slide. Great. So when it comes to reporting fraud, you can choose one of two options to report, report fraud and corruption. Option one is to report directly to your supervisor or program director. Your supervisor will then report to IntraHealth and ultimately IntraHealth must report to the Office of the Inspector General. Option two is to report directly to the Office of the Inspector General. Contractors and grantees implementing projects with U.S. funds are obligated to comply with mandatory disclosure requirements. If you're an employee of such an organization, you also have a choice to submit complaints to the hotline directly. The OIG maintains a web portal for any individuals to report fraud, waste, and abuse related to USA programs. Your courage in reporting frauds plays a vital role in ensuring transparency and accountability in our programs. Now let's learn about what you should report. We can flip to the next slide. Okay. So let's talk about two highly critical matters that must be reported. One is trafficking in persons incidents. Trafficking in persons is a grave crime and a violation of human rights, often seen as sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and child soldiering. It's essential to recognize indicators of human trafficking like physical abuse, hazardous work conditions, or being closely monitored. Psych psychological signs such as fearfulness or substance abuse may also be present. Understanding the signs is one of the ways to combat this type of fraud. Additionally, it's, it's generally prohibited to engage in transactions or provide material support to countries, groups, or persons sanctioned by the US government. You can refer to the list of sanctions in the link provided below so that you can see what groups or persons are in that list of sanctions that are prohibited. You must be wondering now, what specific information do I need to report if I have an instance of fraud to report? Let's flip to the next slide. Okay, so what should you report? When reporting fraud and corruption, accuracy is crucial. Be sure to include a clear description of the alleged wrongdoing, details of the parties involved, and any supporting evidence like documents or witness statements or any available evidence you have. Specify when and where the activities occurred and provide financial details such as transactions and irregularities. If seeking whistleblower protection, indicate your uh, preference to be anonymous. Include your a contact um, information only if willing to be identified. Remember, specific and detailed information will help the OIG initiate investigations and address allegations promptly and effectively. By providing these key details, you play an essential role in ensuring an efficient and thorough investigation problem process. So don't hesitate to speak up and report any fraudulent or corrupt activities that you observe. Your information can make a significant difference in preventing and combating fraud and corruption, promoting integrity and safeguarding the organization's reputation. 
Now let's get in, now let's understand what protections exist for you if you have something to report. Let's flip to the next slide. So when reporting a complaint to the OIG, you can choose to remain anonymous and still receive protections under federal whistleblower status. Employees of government contractors, some contractors grantees and subgrantees making protected disclosures cannot face discrimination. All complaints submitted to the hotline are treated with high sensitivity. You have the option to remain anonymous, provide confidentially, or waive confidentiality and be contacted by OIG personnel or others outside of OIG. However, please note that without contact information, a comprehensive review of the complaint may be challenging and further communication may be limited. If you prefer to be anonymous, ensure no personally identifiable information is included in your complaint narrative or attachments. Your courage to report concerns is essential. Okay, so now we can get into knowledge check number four for this part. Knowledge check number four. Um, when reporting to OIG, you must disclose your name when submitting a report to the hotline. True or false? So just as it comes through, I just want to understand how can employees be assured that their reports will remain confidential and protected when reporting fraud and corruption to the OIG? Yeah, that's a good question, Karen. Um, the OIG is committed to protecting the confidentiality of whistleblowers. Whistleblowing is an important concept of, you know, fraud and corruption and identifying instances of fraud and corruption. So mm -hmm. when employees report fraud and corruption, their identities can be kept confidential and federal whistleblower status safeguard them from retaliation. The OIG takes these matters very seriously and ensures that individuals who report misconduct are fully protected. And I do have one more question just to give people a little bit more time to answer that knowledge check uh, question. Um, what types of information um, should be included in a report when reporting fraud or other critical matters to the OIG? Yeah. So when submitting a report to the OIG, um, as we mentioned previously in this part, it's crucial to provide as much information as you can and feel comfortable sharing. Um, it's crucial to provide accurate information as well, right? This includes clear description of what the alleged fraud is, the critical matter, the details about who's involved, time and location of the incident, financial information if applicable, and again, contact information if you choose to disclose your contact information. The more specific and detailed the report is, the better it aids OIG in conducting effective, effective investigations and addressing the matter promptly. It's also important to note that if you suspect fraud, it is important to report fraud as soon as you suspect it um, to help OIG investigate as soon as, as, soon as possible. So um, we can close the poll, Melissa. The answer um, to that knowledge check question is B, false. And we had about 83% if you get that right. So thank you all. Um, just back to you. Great. I'm going to hand it now to Antonio to teach us on what happens when fraud is detected and reported. Thanks, Jess, and thanks, Karen. Um, so now that everyone has a better understanding of what to do when you detect fraud, we're going to spend a few moments discussing uh, what actually happens when fraud is detected and reported. So to do that, um, we're going to give you, uh, we're going to go over the role of the two actors primarily involved in actually addressing fraud, um, the organization that you work at uh, and the U.S. government. Can we go to the next slide, please? So when fraud is detected, um, yeah, ASAP to partner organizations and intra-health 
have a responsibility to investigate <clears throat> and determine if fraud has actually occurred uh, and then to take certain actions to prevent or mitigate it from occurring in the future. So first, uh, management can investigate the incidents to determine the particular facts and circumstances. This means that they can review records, uh, they can evaluate the premises where the fraud um, was alleged to have occurred, they can interview employees and potentially others, such as vendors, um, who may have witnessed or observed or have information uh, about the incident. If fraud has occurred, <clears throat> they can take additional or appropriate disciplinary action uh, up to and potentially including terminating offending employees or terminating um, relationships with offending vendors. Uh, regardless of whether fraud has occurred or is only suspected to have occurred, uh, it's always good to review and evaluate your policies and procedures uh, and to strengthen existing controls. Oh, I'm sorry, Melissa, can you, I'm sorry, can you, thanks. Um, my apologies for that. <clears throat> um, regardless of whether fraud or, or has, um, Regardless of whether fraud has occurred or is only suspected to have occurred, uh, it's always good to review and evaluate the organization's policies and procedures uh, and strengthen existing uh, controls and processes in order to try and prevent it from occurring in the future. Uh, additionally, regardless of whether fraud has occurred or not, it's really a best practice to report the incident uh, to senior management, um, or if your organization has a board, to your board. Um, if an organization has a board, the members likely have <clears throat> um, a fiduciary duty or some other type of responsibility that requires that they be made aware of the incident. Um, and so it's really just good practice to keep them aware. Um, finally, anyone can refer the incident, uh, whether actual or just alleged, um, to your local law enforcement, as well as to the USAID Office of the Inspector General. Next slide, please. So the one thing to always remember is that, um, you know, your organization is not law enforcement. So if a fraud or other illegal matter, such as human trafficking, um, or it's suspected uh, or known that some type of material support has been given to a US sanctioned entity, um, or if you're just unable to determine whether or not fraud actually occurred, you should always report the matter promptly to the USAID OIG. Uh, and I wanna emphasize again that it should be promptly reported because if you delay reporting it, USAID's investigators could construe ill intent, um, such as they could construe that by delaying the reporting of actual or alleged fraud, you, it, it, you know, it could be construed as, in, you know, someone trying to conceal the fraud um, because it wasn't reported in a timely manner. So the, the thing to remember is that the USAID uh, OIG has their own processes to detect fraud uh, which we'll go over in just a, uh, just a moment. So just remember, if you suspect fraud, you can investigate it, you can take actions, but do so quickly and always remember to report it to USAID shortly thereafter. Um, on the next slide, we'll talk about the role of the Inspector General. Uh, the next slide, please. All right. So the Inspector General's Office is the independent oversight body um, whose mission is um, really to prevent uh, inefficient and unlawful practices. Uh, the USAID OIG plays a pivotal role in identifying and combating corruption uh, and fraud in foreign assistance programs uh, through its global law enforcement and audit activities as well as through the relationships that it establishes with oversight counterparts around the world. The um, Inspector General uh, will act on reports of corruption and fraud that affect foreign aid programs, uh, and it'll work to hold bad actors accountable. Um, on the next slide, we'll talk about the different actors that are involved. So 
So the Office of Inspector General is headed by um, the, in <clears throat> the Inspector General, who is typically appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the US Senate. This puts them on par with the heads of the agencies that they oversee. Um, so for USAID, there's Samantha, you know, Administrator Power, and you know, uh, she's appointed and confirmed, and also it, so is the Inspector General. Um, the Inspector General oversees the operations of their agencies, uh, which in US, USAID's case includes two main functions. First, there is the audit, the Office of Audit. Uh, inspections and investigations. This um, office conducts performance audits and uh, other oversight in order to evaluate program effectiveness, uh, efficiency, and effective um, <clears throat> uh, and efficiency, uh, as well as internal control and compliance. Uh, they also review financial audits of grantees and contractors. Um, their work typically results in recommendations to agency leadership on improving the uh, effectiveness, the economy, the efficiency, and the internal control and compliance with um, the requirements of foreign assistance programs. However, through their audits of, um, or inspections, they might also uncover uh, fraud, which will then be uh, investigated. Secondly, uh, there is the Office of Investigations, and it's this office that conducts worldwide investigations into uh, allegations of criminal, civil, and administrative violations. Um, and these can include fraud, and then this includes fraud and corruption, uh, as well as other violations of U.S. Uh, law um, by those involved with any USAID funded programs. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the USAID Office of Investigations is staffed with trained, credentialed, and sworn special agents. Uh, these are trained criminal investigators who are federal law enforcement officers here in the United States, um, as well as they have investigative attorneys and administrative investigators. Um, USAID investigators, you know, whenever an incidence of fraud has occurred, have the authority to take and may take sworn written statements. These are affidavits. Uh, from persons uh, involved in matters handled by the um, Inspector General. When is an investigation is complete, the uh, Inspector General will generally produce a report based on relevant witness testimony, records, and other evidence. Uh, the report is then provided to appropriate individuals so that they can consider what, if any, corrective actions need to be taken based on the results of the investigation. Um, this report is generally confidential and is not is generally not released to the public. Um, one thing to remember is that absent your consent when providing a, a hotline complaint, uh, the OIG will generally not disclose the name of any individual who submitted a report to the OIG hotline unless they determine that the disclosure is unavoidable during the course of an investigation. So even if you do provide your name, they will generally try to protect your, um, your anonymity. Um, additionally, as we mentioned, it is a crime to commit fraud against the government of the United States. So when the Inspector General determines that fraud has been committed and that that fraud may be in violation of US law, they are required to refer the matter to another another agency in the US government. Uh, this is the US Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is, re is then responsible for uh, making a determination, uh, a legal determination as to whether or not they're going to prosecute the individual or entities involved in the fraud and then prosecuting that person uh, in accordance with US jurisprudence. On the next slide, we'll talk about what are some of the consequences of fraud. So when fraud has been found to have been committed, there are many potential consequences and outcomes. And throughout our discussion today, we've highlighted many of them uh, from diminished ability to achieve program objectives and outcomes to loss of current and future USAID funding to criminal, civil, and other penalties. 
The most important thing to remember is that those that commit fraud can lose their jobs. They can be sent to prison uh, for the fraud and other related crimes, um, such as wire fraud, if they use the banking systems to facilitate that crime, as well as uh, tax related charges. And just to give you an example of what I mean by that, um, a few years ago, a person was convicted of committing fraud. Uh, they were sent to prison uh, for their actions against the government, uh, and they were forced to repay more than a million dollars for not only committing the fraud, um, but also they were convicted of failing to file um, to report the foreign account where they held, where they hid the proceeds uh, of the crime, and they were also convicted of failing to file accurate tax return forms to the IRS because of the interest they had earned on on the proceeds of their of their their crime. Um, so it, it's just you know not only you know it's not just the act of the fraud, but it's also other related acts that you that anyone that commits fraud can be caught up in. Um, finally, those that commit fraud can be fined uh, and they can be forced to pay restitution to the victims of the fraud. Um, and on the next slide, we'll go into some examples of fraud, uh, some actual recent examples where fraud was committed and the consequences. So <clears throat> as Chairman Greenspan reminded us at the beginning of today's session, fraud happens. Um, it's, it's, you know, um, you can't, you know, you can't prevent people from committing fraud, but what you can do is prevent, is try to take steps to prevent it in your, you know, from happening to your organization, and then to take steps to mitigate it. Um, all any of us can do is just, you know, try and detect, report it, and try and prevent it from happening to us. Um, but before we get into our final knowledge check, I do want to share with you two recent real life instances of fraud that um, we've talked about today. Um, the first instance that I want to talk about involves a serious moment that resulted in loss of trust brought on by rampant fraud. Um, so a few, so earlier this year, during a routine monitoring trip in March of 2023, USAID discovered significant evidence that USAID funded food commodities uh, that were intended to support roughly 12 million people living in famine-like conditions in the Afar, Amara, and Tigray regions in Ethiopia were instead being diverted and were being sold on local markets. Um, just as an example, they discovered that 2,000 metric tons of wheat in USAID branded bags which is enough to feed 134,000 vulnerable people for a month, was for sale in a local grain market and was being processed into flour at mills owned by local wholesalers. So because of the scale of the, of the fraudulent activity um, and the need to work with Ethiopian national and Tigray regional governments to enact better fraud uh, and corruption um, prevented prevention and mitigation controls, USAID made the, the painful um, but necessary decision to temporarily pause any further food assistance in the region in May of this year. Um, this is really a key example of how fraud can impact program delivery. The second instance uh, was actually just uh, announced late last month where the human resources director of a non-governmental organization pleaded guilty to falsifying invoices uh, in order to make it appear as if goods and services paid by the organization she worked at uh, but, um, uh, were, but were actually sent to other parties with whom she had a relationship with. Um, this case just moved into the penalty phase, uh, but you know she will have to repay the four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars that she stole. Um, and upon sentencing, she could face up to twenty years in prison when the when the case is finally adjudicated. What these cases show is that you know fraud can be committed by anyone. Um, they also show that when it does occur. Uh, the U.S. government will actively investigate and pursue criminals who commit fraud, uh, and they will take action that could impact the program's ability to achieve outcomes. 
Um, importantly, you know, when fraud does occur, it can have dire consequences uh, for those that are guilty or that are those that are found guilty of committing committing them. Um, I think we'll go into our final knowledge check. Karen. Thank you, Antonio. Knowledge check number five. Um, which function within the OIG is responsible for investigations for instances of fraud? Office of Audit Inspections and Evaluations or the Office of Investigations? As that comes in. Um, so I do see uh, quite a bit of questions right now in the chat, Antonio. Um, maybe you can take the first one. Do embezzlers have to pay taxes off, off on funds they steal? So that is a great question. Um, and um, I think, you know, it will, uh, it's ultimately will be decided um, at, at sentencing. What I will say is that one of the most notorious um, criminals in US history, Al, um, Al Capone, um, what he was actually convicted of uh, was tax evasion because through the crime, the fraud and the corruption that he committed, um, through, you know, um, by selling illegal uh, alcohol, he was convicted of failing to pay, to file tax returns and pay income tax on the, um, on, on uh, the proceeds of his crime, of his criminal activity. Um, there's another question. I'm going to read it out as well. Um, when you say fraud, when you say report fraud promptly, um, is there an acceptable time timeline provided um, or seeing that the report will have to be uh, accurate following an internal investigation? Um, promptly, I, I mean, I would generally, that's a great question. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, promptly should be within, you know, seven to 10 business days. Um, that should give you a, more than enough time to at least try and gather all the facts um, and other information related to the fraud. Um, but I, I would generally say, you know, seven to 10 business days. But um, what I can do is come back on that question after the presentation, um, after, you know, and uh, get a more definitive answer from my friends in the uh, IG shop. Let's go ahead and answer this question, actually close out the poll. Melissa, um, the answer to it is um, the Office of Audit Inspections and Evaluation. So um, right now, I think there was, a, a, you know, there were differences in the answers that we got. It was quite across the board. Um, so Antonio, I, we can just go back and answer a couple of these questions again. Um, there are some on the chat over here. What are some of the examples of fraud and corruption? Uh, can a subcontractor detect from the contracted partner and how uh, can they be reported? I think we covered some of this content just a little while ago. But... So what are some of the examples of fraud and corruption that a subcontractor to a contractor um, Sub, yeah. Um, what are some of the examples of fraud and corruption that I, I guess a subcontractor can detect um, from their partner and how they how could that be reported? I guess how could a subcontractor subcontractor detect fraud is really the question and report it. Sure. Um, so first of all, you know, they could they always have the option of reporting the, the instance of fraud to directly to the inspector general. Um, how they would detect it would be through <clears throat> um, controls. So, uh, you know, an, a good example of a control um, are those controls that aim to trust but verify any information that they receive. Um, so, for example, if they're receiving um, <clears throat> an invoice, right? Um, a good control would be to check the invoice uh, and verify that the information is accurate on, on the invoice. Um, 
So another question over here is, I think it's a little bit more directed towards USAID. How does USAID ensure an uninterrupted support to the beneficiaries during the time of investigation? I think it's a little bit more situational, right, Antonio? Yeah, this is uh, this can be various facts and circumstances based and based on, <clears throat> you know, what is going on. Um, you know, USAID, USAID inspector generals um, generally tr try to um, not interrupt the actual operations of the program. Um, but what they may require is they may require uh, the time of people and they may require time to meet with certain people at the organization. Uh, and they may also request some additional documentation, but they're not going to necessarily come in right away and stop stop work without uh, first thinking it through, you know, for, without first taking other steps to, min you know, other minimally invasive steps. And um, thank you for that, Antonio. The last question I have over here is basically saying, what is USAID ultimately like really concerned about and reporting to in the OIG report and the outcome of the report? Is it really um, the OIG is investigating the concern? Do they investigate concerns of the partner organizations uh, in this report? Or is it mainly focused on um, USAID, I guess, or OIG in that report? So USAID will take all allegations of fraud or corruption very, very seriously. Um, but just because they, you know, but what will, what sometimes will happen is that um, after sort of a preliminary review of the complaint, they may defer to USAID on how to handle it. So for example, um, they may ask USAID to um, conduct you know, a, a further evaluation and talk to the partner organization to get additional information before, to, before uh, the IG decides to really involve itself. Um, so, but you know, they, they absolutely will take every single instance of fraud and corruption that's reported to them very seriously. So that's all the questions that I had, Antonio, and um, reverting back to you. All right. Um, thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, <clears throat> so there are some additional resources, um, you know, that everybody has access to. These are public resources on how to um, identify fraud, how to um, handle fraud with your, within your partner organization, and also more knowledge on sort of what types of frauds um, you might expect in uh, you, the, you know um, <clears throat> in the delivery of healthcare services, um, as well as additional information on um, the statute that protects whistleblowers. This is uh, 41 USC 40 section 4712. Um, the most important thing, however, is just always refer to your organization's policies and procedures, particularly the organization's code of conduct and its fraud policy, fraud and corruption policy. Next slide, please. So before we close out, firstly, on uh, behalf of Jess, Karen, and myself, uh, we really want to thank you for your time today. Uh, you've learned a lot today about how to identify fraud, what steps uh, you and your organization that you work for can do to prevent and detect fraud, and also how to report fraud. Um, but if there's just one thing that uh, we'd really like you to take away from this session today, it's that should you see something, then the best thing to do is say something. A lot of times when you see fraud or corruption occurring, it's generally because you're witnessing or observing something that just doesn't feel right. Uh, and so as a result, you may not know exactly what is going on right away, or worse, the situation can be dangerous. So don't take it upon yourself to intervene or address the situation right there. Rather, say something by reporting it to your supervisor to IntraHealth um, and or to the USAID OIG. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Karen, turn mm -hmm. back to you. 
Yeah, and Tony, there was a question in the chat. What steps should be followed if an employee who has reported gets uh, reported fraud gets threats? So, like, essentially, um, you know, trying to if they if they do report the fraud, are there and if they do get some retaliation, what are some of the steps that they could, could take? Yeah, so that's that's a really great question, uh, and unfortunately, can happen. Um, I would say that the best thing that can be done is that, um, you know, the employer should really look out for the well-being of that employee. Um, they can take steps to try and, in, you know, the employer can try and take steps to intervene and get in the middle of it. Um, you know, they can report the incident to, they, and they should definitely report the incidents to local law enforcement. Who can then, you know, determine what additional steps need to be taken. Um, there was a couple of questions, um, Antonio, on how the HR director, the example that you shared, essentially, the HR di director, how was that person, um, you know, um, reported or, you know, how did, what, what, it, what, you know, additional consequences like happened? So I, I, I was trying to monitor the other chat as well. So that was something sure. that came to the other chat. How did they? Sure. I mean, so the exact details, um, you know, have not been published. Uh, and that is generally consistent with USAID, um, with USAID IG's policy is they, you know, they try not to um, publish the details. Um, what usually happens when a, when um, something happens is upon conviction, um, it'll be, you know, the public will be notified that this person was found guilty and what they were found guilty of. Um, generally, so, uh, you know, this instance occurred because essentially um, she was basically using the credit card of her company to buy the credit card that her organization issued to her to buy products and services for another organization that she had a relationship with and then invoiced um her organization um my guess is that it was uh if i if i had to take a, a guess here uh and this is probably what happened but again i i can't confirm because i, I wasn't part of the investigation is that when they were reviewing her invoices and her expense reports, they couldn't substantiate where that what that money was being spent on and where the goods and services went. And so they conducted an investigation and they found that she was buying all of this stuff. It wasn't going to anything that helped the organization. And so when they contacted the inspector general, the inspector general probably got involved and um, you know, did a much more thorough investigation. Thank you, Antonio, for that. Um, there are no additional questions in the chat, mainly comments uh, to share um, the presentation. I think as Melissa mentioned, the presentation will be shared on the Interhope website. Um, so nothing else more to add into okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and I hope that um, I wish you all the best in fighting fraud and corruption uh, in, the, uh, in the delivery of your missions. Thank you very much. Looks like one more question just popped oh, through if you wanted to ask it, Karen. Yeah. Would you encourage organizations to have anti-fraud policy to manage how uh, suspicious or um, cases of fraud should be investigated or, um, or act arbitrarily? Uh, that is a great question. So all organizations should have an anti-fraud and anti-corruption policy. And as part of that policy, they should uh, outline what are the specific investigative procedures the organization will follow to investigate um, uh, the incident. The reason why you want these documented is because is exactly for what you're describing, right? Is to prevent the organization from acting arbitrarily. The policy should require that all incidences be reported, that they be investigated following a set set of guidelines uh, that will guide the investigation, and that the results of the investigation be reported to senior management for further adjudication and action.
can you assist organizations in developing um, anti-fraud policies or um, on what they can adopt? Yes, um, we can definitely assist uh, organizations in uh, developing anti-fraud policies. There are also um, several sort of leading practice policy templates uh, that can be found online, um, as well as through, uh, you can also visit the USAID website um, for um, information that should be included. Um, is there a whistleblowing policy or poster or both? Um, so um, I would ask um, IntraHealth uh, if they can give you a whistleblower poster. Um, uh, most organizations have one, even the USAID OIG um, has a whistleblower poster that can be found on its website. Um, why would a person who reports the fraud um, choose not to disclose his or her contact information? Uh, that is a great question. Um, USAID OIG provides um, reportees with the ability to remain anonymous and uh, remain anonymous. Um, but in all cases, they will definitely do their best um, when they're not anonymous to try and protect, protect the confidentiality. Why someone might choose to remain anonymous is very dependent on that person's unique circumstances. Maybe they're, uh, for, for example, they could be a, a friend or be a close relationship with the person that committed the instance, uh, committed the, that committed the incident, and they just don't want to run the risk of uh, you know, being identified um, as a person who reported it. Um, ultimately, it is very much dependent on that person's facts and circumstances. Why would someone choose, decide to commit fraud when they know the consequences? Um, so this goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the fraud triangle. Um, you know, uh, I generally like to say fraud will happen. It it will happen because someone may just rationalize that uh, and justify why they're doing it. Um, they could, you know, you know, perceive some type of injustice. Um, they're undergoing a, <clears throat> they're they're under duress. For example, they may, be, you know, be heavily in debt, uh, and they perceive that the consequences of the crime are less than uh, the the rewards of the of the actual fraud. Um, there are, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, there are an inex inexplicable number of reasons why someone can choose to commit fraud, but it generally has to do because there's an opportunity that opened for them, they rationalized it, or they justified their action, uh, and there's some type of um, stress that they're, they're, they're under that's causing them to do it, and that the rewards of the crime are greater than the penalties they may face. I don't see any more questions in turn. Oh, there's one more. So any advice on how to manage suspicious suspicions of fraud before reporting to yeah, USAID? Yeah, I, I would um I would definitely take steps to try and investigate the facts and circumstances, uh, including how the fraud was able to be committed to begin with so, um, before you report it to USAID, but I wouldn't take too long to report it to USAID. Um, what should be done to one um, to the one that reported? Okay. I think um, we're just trying to say what should be done uh, if they do report fraud. Yep. Uh, what could be done to the person who reports fraud? A situation based. Yeah. So um, if I understand the question, um, if someone reports fraud, um, reports you know alleged um, incident of fraud. And after the investigation, it was found that fraud wasn't actually committed, if, if, if that is how I understand it. Um, you know, most organizations, um, you know, have what's called an anti-retaliatory policy. Uh, and basically what that, said, what that means is that if I reported something in good faith, um, I had good faith to believe that a fraud was committed, um, then, you know, I, you know, then no one can retaliate against me or take action against me 
uh, for having reported it to begin with. Um, if your organization doesn't have an anti-retaliatory policy, I would definitely adopt one um, because uh, having that kind of a policy will, you know, will ensure that employees will feel free to report whatever they suspect as long as they had a good faith reason to report it to begin with. Yeah, and the last question, Antonio, I think is basically what you answered. What I mean, but the consequences of a report not being conf confidential is really what it is. What is um, mm -hmm. they suffer, um, you know, prejudice or any, any additional consequences as a result of reporting? Um, so, um, I, I would say that this is very situational. Um, it is generally unlikely that if you report something confidentially, it will get out in the public. But if it does, then I would um, a first work with, um, you know, if it's your organization, I would first work with your organization to understand what happened. Why was your why was something that you reported confidentially, re you know, reported out um, with your, you know, with uh, your con with whoever reported it, it's information. Um, and I think that uh, also I know that what USAID would do is if uh, OIG is if uh, if they're unable to protect the confidentiality of the person, they will work with that person or persons um, to protect them. Do you still keep the person's details anonymous even after the person serves? Yes, yes. So if USAID uh, OIG is able to keep um details of who reported it anonymous that report is anonymous like i said um the <clears throat> the um report that usaid oig releases is generally kept confidential it is generally not released to the public um now you know in the punishment phase or during the prosecution of it um confidentiality confidentiality may not be able to be maintained um, for example, if you have to testify, if somebody has to testify um, um, about what they witnessed or what they observed, um, but at that point, the prosecutors would work with uh, the person, the, the, you know, with, with those persons. Thank you. you answered this question as well, um, Antonio. But um, the question is basically, what if the the you, you report it anonymously, but the information is not kept confidential? Yeah, I think I, um, you know, like I said earlier, um, if the contact isn't kept confidential, um, you, you know, you definitely need to work with the organization. Um, you know, these are very, you know, facts and circumstances based, um, but definitely work with the organization. And I also know that USAID OIG and the Department of Justice uh, will also work with those persons um, in order to protect them. I think there were quite some more interest. That's pretty much all we had on the questions. And um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. Um, on this one, I will get. I would like to just respond separately to that. You can go ahead and type your answer, Antonio, and send it privately if you prefer to do that. Sure. Yep. If anyone has, we have um, just some time remaining. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, you can answer or ask questions anonymously if you prefer that. Um, we'll leave the Q&A box open for a few minutes um, and answer any questions that come in. Um, and then if there are no further questions, we can go ahead and close out the webinar. But um, We'll leave that it open just for a few more minutes. If you, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And this is Karen, that one, oh, that one question that's in there, um, Antonio is going to answer typed. Um, 
Okay, as soon as Antonio is done answering that question, we can go ahead and close out the webinar. I just need to do one last thing before we finish. Um, it looks like there aren't any further questions. So let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we'd like to thank our presenters, Antonio, Jessica, and Karen for an excellent webinar. Um, again, the presentation as well as a recording of today's webinar will be available on the um, IntraHealth website at the ASAP resources page um, for you to download and view. Um, additionally, we'd like to thank USAID for their continued support in um, funding these and supporting these webinars. Um, and lastly, we'd like to thank all of you, our participants, for joining us today. If you'd like news on um, any further webinars, um, please feel free and sign up for our newsletter um, where you can receive any updates on future webinars. Um, and thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.